So, hello everyone. My name is Corinne Hoffman and I work at Cybers. And today I am going to be the one presenting you the, some of the new stuff from MPM5. And my colleague Burkhard is going to show you some uh, new interesting stuff in Node.js V8. So, what's new? The NPM install now says by default. You don't have to type minus minus save or save that. It does it by default. If you already know the big, uh, the big uh, feature for this release is the package log JSON. More on that. Uh, now you have also an offline fallback when you're uh, pulling uh, modules. If you have them already, the thing is not going to check against, uh, against um, NPM online. It's just going to try to, to uh, use your cache. And um, it's less verbose. The only thing is you don't have that big splash at the end with the whole tree with your node modules. It's just uh, we downloaded 2,000 modules for you and be happy. That's all um, that you get now. And it's faster. It's way faster. So, whoops. So, how fast did it get? I just did a test with one of our uh, modules and, well, MPM4 was, for me, fast enough, I guess. 24 seconds, now MPM5 is um, 10 seconds faster around, but yarn is still faster, so it's your choice what you want to use if you are just looking for uh, download speed. But what about shrink wrap? We already had uh, something like the package log. Well, the package log and shrink wrap are both the same. They're just uh, different names for the same thing. If you are using npm5 and, uh, and you have a shrink wrap file, it's going to respect that. And if you use, uh, and if you have both of those files, it's going to use shrink wrap first and after that the package log JSON. And if your module has a package log JSON file and you use shrink wrap, it's just going to uh, rename it to shrink wrap. So that's um, more or less the thing that changed there. So um, a thing that you can do with the package log JSON is you cannot publish it. You cannot add it to the manifest even if you do it's not going to get published. With, the, with shrink wrap, you can do that. So if you want to ship like a, um, like a common line interface with all dependencies fixed, I will recommend to you to still use shrink wrap so everything gets built. If you're uh, publishing an NPM module, don't publish shrink wrap and don't try to uh, publish the package log JSON. So, the most annoying thing, though, in the whole uh, the whole change with npm five, for me, I did. Well, I did what the what most uh, developers would do: just fix a line, put node eight in there. And let's see if our continuous integration, continuous develop, uh, deployment system can just do magic. Well, it can. Um, um, the linking change and the way 
uh, local file packages are linked, changed. So the old behavior with MPM4 was if you were just referencing a module in the same path, just like in the picture here, it will copy the whole content. So um, you could uh, start multiple containers and install all your packages and it wouldn't uh, crash in that sense because it would always copy from A to B and that was a feature or a bug that we were using. So what uh, the new behavior is not copying but sim linking just like link work. And linked does not longer work as linked work before. It's a little bit confusing, I know. Um, before link were also seem links. You can still do that. It's not going to copy over your modules if you link them in the uh, if you link them. But once you do npm install all your links are gone because the new uh, the new npm install tries to resolve everything to hoist the, the module so it's just going to symlink to your module if it's a file it's going to symlink to the module try to uh, to solve all dependencies and crash. So that was our experience. Why did it crash? Probably because we have some circular dependency. I, uh, I still have to check that. But it's uh, for us it was a big change because it's now broken. You, we can just uh, upgrade and do npm install and everything is fine. So you should uh, probably uh, also look into that. So, um, again, what did it change? Now we have a uh, package log JSON to keep everything fixed. It's the same as the shrink wrap. It's a little bit faster. And the linking uh, is uh, uh, the linking change. Yeah, that's, I guess, the everything to npm5 okay. Good. Great. <laughs> so hello everyone first of all I would like to say thank you to Oli and also to Gregor there he is uh, to give me the opportunity to have a talk here actually it's my <coughs> first meetup and I'm immediately a speaker so let's see how it works but uh, Really nice, yeah, I'm enjoying the possibility. So let's see, um, I'm actually a long-term C++ developer. I did 10 years long C++ in my former work. Now I'm also at Cybis, a colleague of uh, Cornelio. And um, actually I was thinking to show you on the new NPM, uh, on the new Node, the, the NAP and so on. There is a nice C++ integration stuff and so on. But I had no time to prepare all this as a C++ because you know C++ is a terrible hell with compiling and so on. So I went for something different, which is uh, async await, which I believe is really nice and helps me already today. Uh, and what I want to try to show you is how we can use it and how I'm already using it inside this. For two showcases that we have, and I want to showcase one, and this is a longer showcase, it's a back-end showcase, and I have a front-end showcase. So in the back-end, I will try to convey that it's simpler with async await to do some coordination stuff. We have. Um, typical example that we have to coordinate lots of connections because, because we are doing lots of IoT, so we're connecting, connecting to lots of IoT protocols and this is always a connection establishment. And you have to manage this and you have to wait until connections are established, until you can go on and so on. And this, this gives some kind of a back-end problems, state machines and so on we will talk about. This. So we'll see how a single way can help there. And in the front end, I don't know how many of you are knowing React.js and Redux Okay, there are a few. So maybe I'm boring you, so, so we'll see. But if you come to that, you can, you can see how we do. Huh? But it's nice. There are so many that know. Okay, let's go on. So the back-end case. 
<coughs> coordinated weighting. So what I want to do with you also with some, with some coding stuff, I want to state this problem. So we have a manager, let's start here. And I want the manager to manage a client, first of all, a single client. This client should connect to some protocol. It has a client to some whatever protocol. This is what we picked here. My application says, wants to enable the manager. And what means enable the manager means the manager should establish, or should ask the client to establish connections to whatever. So we get an event enabled to the manager, and the manager will say, please connect client. And then, of course, the, 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 the event of connect is nothing that happens immediately. Yeah? Connection establishment can take some time. You know, this is a proper, typical thing for uh, promises, then chains, and so on. So what we want is actually, we want to get the state connecting back, but we want, in the same code, we want to wait until really everything is connected. Yeah? We want to maybe still tell the application that this connection process is in process, actually, uh, we enabled it. Uh, we are enabling, actually. Once we really connect it, the client tells us, we will go on with the business code that must come after, or that can only run after we have a proper state connected. And then we will say that at some point in the, that's convenient for us, the application. Fine, we are enabled, the manager is fine, we have the client. Uh, seems easy if you have such a, <coughs> such a thing, or of course, um, the real life is more complex. We, we have to deal with lots of clients still having a single manager with different connection times and so on and so on. And then the story gets more complex if you go into the then, then fetch thing and so on. Yeah. And what I want to, sh to showcase you today how this can be solved with async pattern and with a state machine approach or with a state machine that is async wait where. Yeah. Who, who has heard about state machines, the concept about state machines? Not so many. Okay, well, I will do a quick refresher from what I understand what state machines are. So it's not so much note, we come later to the note. But, um, so state machines, in short, are, well, you have, a, you have a, the overall logic of a state machine, which is the transitions and the events. So you know this maybe all. You have a, this is a state. The dog barks, is a state. He gets petted, which is the event. Then you wax tail, this is a state again, and so on. And you have a way to show this in the diagram or in the table. The table is just the same, the same uh, representation of the same thing. And then the uh, UML standard says, actually, how to go from one target source state to some target state, so from to two. Actually, this is quite standardized, actually. So you have actually, you're sitting in some state, you get an event in, and then there, these are the hooks that go on the way, so you have a guard that checks finally two fours can be go, can't be go. If you go, then this is a start to end algorithm, should not be stopped. We cannot avoid this. We will, whatever happens, reach the two state. And we have, a, we have some hooks that are called. We exit the from state, we have an action in between, and we enter the two state. What is important is that the theory states well, there should be no time spent here during these hooks. So there should be more or less a zero time start to end transition. So if you think about this and the, and the process of a connection, then actually you come to some conclusion that you shouldn't do the connection process itself on these hooks while transitioning from one state to the next. But actually you should, you should invest in an own state for the connection process itself because because connecting is a process that takes time, and we should not spend time between states. And uh, I did this in my last project. I, I, I worked also with state machines. It was, took me some time to comprehend this, that this is wrong at the wrong place, actually. So uh, going back to the manager and to the client, maybe let's look at the client first here. So clearly, we have something like disconnected, connecting, connected, and disconnecting states. And we have the whens connect, connects done, disconnect, and disconnect done. You see already the strange underscore here. What I want to indicate already is who is triggering the events. It's nothing that the state machine fixes, so events come from inside or from outside. In this case, I already, already want to point you that the application will do the connect to the, or in this case, actually, the manager will, will ask the client to connect. Then the client will go to connecting state. But the next event is actually nothing coming from the, from the manager because he cannot know when the connection did happen. That's only the client knows. And we want to internally inject an event to our state machine, which is 
just fine. No? You, you can just trigger ourselves an event, which I, which I mark with an underscore just to, uh, just to have a, the privacy in. But this is actually a problem with this most of state machines. I've looked at a lot of state machines implementation in, uh, that are available as NPM packages, and most of them even say you cannot, while you are, because the hooks that are provided are hooks that are, that are, that are triggered if you are within the transition. So if you're, if you're giving yourself another event, it's always forbidden now because you should not, uh, you should not start an event after this and so on. You're missing the hook that you can fire while you are sitting on a state. This is what I want to show you today. Clearly, the, the state diagram of the manager is just the same. I just use different vocabulary. So disabled, enabled, enabling, disabling. So I condense what I said. I believe the solution is to not do the things. The solution is to do the things on the state and not between them. So after all the years I looked at state machines, I would say just forget about these hooks. They are more or less useless. I don't know what one should really do there nicely. Or rather, you go from this connect, you get the connect event. You will, what you have to do asynchronously inform any listeners about your state change because you really are going to, to change the state. We, we really, after this event went through and the table said this is okay, you can go connect, disconnect, and connect. It's an okay event. You can already say, here, state has changed. But then you are sitting in connecting, and what's more important is you need a hook, a new hook, which is on connecting, where you are where you're triggered while you're sitting in the state. And it should be just fine. So what you need to do is here in the, in the implementation of this hook, you want to do the connect business. You really want to say, client, yes, here, connect to this specific protocol. Once you did this, you want to trigger yourself with connect done, which is just a regular event which comes from inside, not from outside, and then you happily go to connect it. So now you ask yourself, what, what this to do with async and so on and so on. What I want to show you is that I want actually to await the connection here. <coughs> so I want the, want the manager to say await connect and if I have a chain of async awaits then I can, and because I fire this event, I can actually await until we go to connect it. Still having all the features of being updated asynchronously. And I don't have to await it. I could just not await it. I will see connecting state in between and await it later. But that's what I need, I think, in the, in the generic application. So let's look at some code and, and, and see what, we, what I did here. So let's measure the what the fuck that you will say. But um, OK. So actually, I tried to implement what I showed you there. The client, the manager, and some application. So you remember this first slide. And um, so I want to, want to show you some real code. So let's go through it a bit. Um, you may be confused by the, by the syntax here. I'm not using new and uh, new classes and so on. We at Cybers decided after long discussions to go for factory function, which is the Elliot approach, which you may be seen. So that's why you see this. So this is a factory function, actually. You'll see later in the return statement. Um, here you see the transition table. Actually, this is initial state. It should be disconnected. You see the transitions, just as I showed in the slides, um, just as an array of, an, uh, of object rows. Connect, event connect, brings us from disconnected to connecting. Connect done, goes from connecting to connected, and so on. And what is now interested, interesting? What I want to implement is exactly here, as I said. I want to have a hook on connecting. So that means I'm called if I'm in connecting state. And I'm just, just showing you the console log connecting. And then what I want to do here is really do the connection, which I'm not doing here for the demo purpose. Well, you see already how I can use this. So the promise delays, I'm using Bluebird, as you've seen maybe in the beginning. I'm awaiting here, now the promise delay. And, and that's the first message I have to say. If you use async await, it's actually really, really simple. It works just, it's just promises with bit sugar. So clearly this returns a promise here. And any promise you can await, which means the code will actually run synchronously. You can read it synchronously. It will more or less stop here, but it not really stops, of course. Only, only the execution here, the interpreter stops here, but it, it actually the code executes any other asynchronous business that's pending in the event loop, it jumps to some other place, of course, like the, the technology is coroutines, clearly. 
And once, once this connection has, has established, we get another event on the event loop, and next time possible, we will be released here, and the wait will go through, here actually after one second, hopefully. And we will trigger here the internal event that's depicted in the, in the state machine above. I will not go, you have seen this. And then we actually trans transitioning to the fully connected state. The same business for disconnecting. Okay, so this is all the code looks like already. You see it? So this is the factory function style. I have to, I have to stay, say something to this. Looks maybe strange. I use object assign here. This is the counter or the analogy to extends. So in other words, you may know this. I'm maybe boring you, but I want to say this. So I have a state machine which you haven't looked at. Namely, the state machine is some, some class, again, a factory function, which takes a transition table as a constructor argument. And I'm actually inheriting this object assigned here from this state machine using this transition uh, element. And that's actually making, it's on this, I'm just writing here on this connecting. Well, this state machine will make business code and interpret the, the table on the top to call me back. It has all the ideas here. It's really short uh, class, we can also look at this. I wrote this new state machine because I found a, new, a, need, a need for a new state machine technology. And then just on connecting and disconnecting. So that's it. Let's have a quick look at the manager, and then we go for uh, the example. Manager is just the same, you see the same pattern. I'm just requiring the client here. I have again a transition table. I have different wording, but the same flow. I create an instance of the client here. And now I want to do what I showed you in the... Uh, this mouse is really tricky. So in the on enabling on the manager, I want to await the, the connection establishment of the client. So I take my client here and I wait to connect. And this is another feature of the state machine. The connect now is really the event and I can await, await the event and the, the await of the event will be changed into the await of the on connecting. So I will wait in the end for the full process to be done. And then I say enable done. It's the same business here. So you see already how you can already anticipate how this nicely can be put together. So if I had two clients, which we can try later, if you have time, I can just simply await both clients and this is the same as a promise all. So actually I have to use because there's no gather like in, in Python. There's, in Python it calls yields from gather or waits gather in the latest release, I believe. We in JavaScript, we have just the wait, and there's nothing await a chain of promises. So we have, would have to say await promise all, but we can try this later. Want to make the pic picture complete. And then the application finally can look like this. Again, we, have, we need to have an async function if you want to await something. And um, you see, this is the code. We create a manager, and then we, we lock the, the state of the manager. We say manager enable, and enable will call this on enable that you've seen. It will call the connect and so on. So manager enable will await until the connection did the, the client did the connection, and then we can say, see the manager state. So let's, let's look at this. So you saw this one second waiting, maybe I just run it again. Uh -huh. Okay, I should update that for the, <laughs> for the meeting. Okay, so, so that's what's happening. Huh? And now you can of course play with the, um, you can play with the gun with this awaits and so on. I will just show you that this first of all is just regular promise uh, games. So manager enable is the async function that I'm calling here. And the async function is the keyword async. It always means it returns a promise. So I can actually get this as a promise, for example. And I await it later. That's just fine. Huh? So I can do these things. Save it. Run it again. You see now the, the difference is subtile, but it's important. So I lock the I lock the states here. So first of all, we are disabled. It's true. Now we say enable, but we are not waiting because this will run now synchronously. I'm just getting the promise. I print again the state. But what I did is I said enable. So the update, the state update internally has happened before. So correctly, it says enabling because I'm enabling. 
and and then I then I wait on the promise. The client says the connecting. If you may have seen after it really connected, I could put the the, the last console lock here. No, of course not there. Sorry, but here, and it should say the right thing. Oh, I need my yes. So enabled. Yes. So let's see. So what can we else do? We can exactly. We can. Yeah. Well, I want to show you maybe one more thing. Let me see how it's of time. Yeah, 22 minutes. I don't want to bore you too long. So I want to show you one other thing on the client. Now on the manager. So simple as this, you can say client. Just take a second instance and now let's say the use case in the beginning I want to wait for the two clients so it's really easy you, you, you can play the, again the promise game so I'm I'm awaiting the first one so first of all I create an array <coughs> so what this means in this in this array, I have the return values of these two functions. They're just promises. So I have an array of two promises. And now I have to use, unfortunately, because there's no await all, I find it's unfortunate, I have to use now the promise.all as a function. And it takes an array of promises. So in this way, so I hope I didn't lose you. This way, I can, I can await two asynchronous asynchronous um, activities at the same time. Yeah. This is really nice in this clean code. And you will see it, I mean, it's not really nicely seeable because we just get, as you saw, we get two connectings. They come at almost at the same time because they triggered at the same moment. They both sleep for a second. But clearly you see if you have clients of different flavors, as we have it for industrial things, um, they happily, it, it waits until the last one is done. Okay. Good, I hope I got, you got some impression how you can play with this. Let me switch back to the, to the presentation. If I click here, will it start from the beginning or not? Oh, no, perfect, good. So just, I haven't shown you the code of the state machine, which is really short, it's just a few hundred lines, really not a lot. Um, so the state machine actually, what it does, for example, this is a, it generates uh, this event functions and the code looks more or less like this if, so this is an event like connect, the connect function really. So if the event is allowed in the current state, update the internal current state to the, to the two state, to the target state, trigger state update callback. Ah, uh, we haven't used this callback. You can register a listener also to the get state callback. I haven't shown you, but do believe me. And then we are just awaiting internally also, this is again async, we are awaiting on the on function, which I've shown you, this on connecting, on enabling with arguments, or else we trigger just the invalid transition is not allowed. I've implemented an easy function, which is also nice. You can just not await immediately, just say connect or enable or whatever, and later at some point you want to conditionally wait. And there's a function in the state machine, so you could say manager dot wait until state, whatever. So this is real code, it really looks like this. So if state equals, the, if the, to be awaited for state equals the inner state, I'm done. Don't have to wait, we're already there. Else, I'm doing something like this here, you see. So I'm creating here a new promise. <coughs> I'm having the event emitter here. This is the internal event emitter that is used namely here to emit the states. I'm connecting to it. And once, once the, once the update equals the, the, the outer state and the inner state, I resolve the promise. So I have a short promise in here, and, and I, this is the promise again, I'm just awaiting it and make it a thing. That's it. Yeah, really nice short code. Okay. Next example, front end. Yeah, questions? Ask always questions in between if I lose you. I have one. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, does, does, does it uh, something to support it already uh, with a new promisify internal method? Can you tell something about it? 
say again, so the promisify uh, that's, that's available without Node 8, you say? In, Even? In Node API, there's a new method, utility method to create a promise based uh, system. Ah, yes. Standard, standard library. Yes, that's true, the promisify stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But this was always there, so promises uh, are always there. Promise. Yes, it's there. Yeah, that's right. So that's anyway some something what I would suggest. Uh, if you, if you, I mean, some code is legal to be callback code yeah? because it's, it must be callbacks. It looks like callbacks. Yeah? But all the other code, like the file system, there is this promisify stuff, or even it's already there. So, so, so it's, my advice would be if you want to use this, use promises. Yeah? I actually thought I have a conclusion slide maybe in the beginning, maybe in the very end. Yeah? So if you use Promisify on all this and, and your stuff anyways returns promises and plays promises, I will summarize this in the end, you can play nice with the Async Await. The Async Await really is sugar for re-establishing really what is the difference. If you do the Zen stuff, you lose your scope always. And that's why the exception handling and so on is so tricky. But the Await is just some sugar where the interpreter establishes back your scoping so that, that it feels like you're in the same scope. But actually what happened the, the interpreter went around and did whatever crazy things, but when you are back in business, it reestablishes for you. Yeah. So yes, if you use Promisify, of course, a nice is a partner of this of this whole technology. More questions already now, or go also later. Good. So I try to keep myself short that we have some time for the pizza. Maybe it's arriving also soon. Um, so this is a diagram that I wrote for the for how I see the Redux um, React flow. So I'm not explaining this because I've seen a lot of people knowing this already. I want to just point you out where my example now is, and this is really just an example of looking at it. And uh, actually, I'm quite new to the React JS Redux stuff, but um, if you do RESTful API calls within your flow, then typically I think the advice is to use the sunk the sunk actions, what is the difference between the, the actions that are provided, the, the, these are objects returned and eaten by the reducers that are fed into the big reducer store, while thunks are returning functions. That means you can dispatch at a later level in a sunk executor or whatever, this is kind of typically some, some part of the middleware or store of the, of the Redux <coughs> system, and there you can dispatch some API call. There is actually, I've, I've seen this today only. <laughs> I implemented a bit of this myself. I saw there is a, um, really a big middleware already for this. So, okay. <laughs> but they are using actually, I think, uh, not uh, async await. Uh, so this is more or less just an example. Uh, so let's quickly look at the one, and I'm not going to code anything, I just wanted to show you an example of code. Don't need the terminal, go away. Okay, so this is maybe a function which is just demonstrating the, so this is general API fetch as a, um, it works within a thunk action, so you can just call it. And you see here, so I'm getting the arguments in in the function, and here I'm just um, returning, so this is the place where I have to return the function instead of the object. What, what I'm returning is the async function, and I can use the async keyword of course also in the short in the shorthand arrow functions here, just place it where I need it. It's placed before a function, so it's a regular function here. Well, shorthand for a function, but I can place it here. And then I can use, again, a weight inside here. That's the nice thing, and uh, here's nothing magically happens. I'm getting the request headers get together and so on in the body, but here it happens. So first of all, this is also nice. I can play suddenly again with try catch in, as a usual thing. Yeah? I don't have to say dot catch in the end and I have to accumulate all the errors on the way, or I can actually pin down the errors as I need it with the scoping of the try-catch blocks as I like. And uh, here I'm just awaiting the, the fetch call. Fetch returns again a promise, so you just can put it await here. And then finally I got the, I got the result set, and if there's some JSON in there, which I'm, which I'm checking here, again, I, this is an asynchronous process in, the, in this fetch library. Um, 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 oh, sounds worse. Oh, I'm missing it. Um, deserializing the string into a JSON object. So I'm again awaiting this. Huh? And then the code just looks, I think, very nice and short. And you can, you can do a proper, you can do a proper error handling and so on. Yeah? 
and you can just dispatch other stuff on the way. And this is just an example. This runs in the, in the regular without any changed code uh, um, React Redux flow. And that's why I wanted to say it's really easy to just put, you know, if you have a big uh, already existing code base, you can just start putting here and there some async weights. It doesn't hurt because it plays nicely with the concept of the promises. Okay, so that's also already my last slide, I hope. I have a long time. Yes, so we had the conclusions. So my take home messages from, from my experience playing with this, the concepts are really simple. Async await plays the promise game. You can await any promise. If your outer function is flagged with our async keyword, you can await also any function that's flagged with our async keyword, but it's not a must as you have, as I have shown you. Those functions just return a promise, so you can just also put it into array, await all, or do whatever later. Hence, mixing up good old then catch with a single wait is no problem. Uh, I would um, just say, you know, grab a function if you just start using it, if you start updating your node 8 and so on. Just grab a function that anyways returns a promise and maybe convert some inner life to a single wait. Uh, so just try it, I, I think. Sometimes one has, to, one has to just also believe into new patterns. Uh. Yeah, that's all I had to say. I took a lot of time already. I want to, to thank uh, my, my company, actually, that gave me time to prepare this talk uh, for, for, for today. And actually, we're also hiring, <laughs> as everyone. Yeah. So thanks for your kind attention, and yeah, that's it. Actually, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm in the moment cleaning up this, and this is really just short code. I'm, I'm glad to put this as an NPM package down, and uh, yeah, yeah we'll do this. Quite yeah, it's um, and I, if, if really I just um, because I don't want to hide anything. Yeah, I just show you just for just one second. Um, so it's not commented yet, but um, so the state machine code is really is only this. That's it. That does all the magic. And the, the here is actually this, this the interesting stuff. But it really is straightforward. It's a small package, but quite quite nice to use. Yeah. So, yeah. More questions? Okay. More questions than in, in person. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Good. So um, yeah. Next one. I think the way is to deal with the blockchain.